Hey everybody, thank you all for joining me for this month's edition of Poets Corner. Um, thank you very much to the Scarlet Bennett Center for having me. I'm Anders Carlson Wee, uh, and glad to be joining you from Cincinnati, Ohio, streaming live. Uh, I'm going to be reading some uh, poems for you from my collection, The Low Passions, uh, which just came out in paperback, uh, so it's light and ready to travel. Uh, and uh, I'm going to read a, a selection, uh, from a kind of a range of poems uh, from the book. Uh, so I'll just jump in and get started. Uh, thank you all so much for joining. Um, and uh, here we go. The, the first poem is, uh, comes out of my childhood, and it's based on a game my brother and I used to play when we were little kids. It's called Dynamite. My brother hits me hard with a stick. So I whip a choke chain across his face. We're playing a game called dynamite, where everything you throw is a stick of dynamite, unless it's pine. Pine sticks are rifles and pine cones are grenades, but everything else is dynamite. I run down the driveway and back behind the garage where we keep the leopard frogs in buckets of water with logs and rock islands. When he comes around the corner, the blood is pouring out of his nose and down his neck, and he has a hammer in his hand. I pick up his favorite frog and say, if you come any closer, I'll squeeze. He tells me I won't. He starts coming closer. I say a hammer isn't dynamite. He reminds me that everything is dynamite. Uh, so that was my childhood but survived it uh, somehow. Uh, and my, my brother and I have, uh, as we've gotten older, um, we uh, started doing a lot of traveling together, uh, mainly hopping freight trains and hitchhiking around the country. And this next poem grows out of one of those experiences. Uh, we were hopping a freight train from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, out to Seattle, Washington, on a route that's called the High Line. And uh, for a route like that, we were going in July. This is very hot weather. And you're going to be on a freight train for four or five days uh, for a route like that. So you need a lot of water uh, because once you get on that train, uh, you know, there's not much more you can do to, to get new supplies. Uh, so we had these really big jugs of, uh, you know, gallons, gallons of water uh, to bring with us. And we were carrying them in our hands uh, down by the train tracks, getting ready. And when our train came, it came in and started slowing down, but it didn't come to a complete stop which meant we had to catch it on the fly. And so we ran up the train tracks, ran up next to the train, and uh, to climb the ladder, we had to do something with these gallon jugs. So we tossed the gallon jugs of water ahead of us onto the train, and then climbed on, uh, got up on the ladder, got up into the train, and we looked down into this hole that we were going to be hiding inside of, and our jugs of water had exploded from the impact, from the drop down into the train. And so we started this cross country trip without any water. And this poem kind of picks up in that situation. There's two words in it you might want to know. One is bowls, and that's a, a word for railroad police officers. They're called bowls. And the gray ghost is a type of owl. This one's called bird calls. I crept around the dark train yard while my brother watched for bowls. Two days deep into the badlands and all our water gone. We had a bird call for if you saw something and another for if you heard. A silent yard, eight strings wide with a few junkers parked. The horizon, a dull burn, the rails lit dimly by dew. I was looking for the water bottles the conductors used and threw out the windows with maybe a sip left inside them. I found one by stepping on it. I sucked it like a leech. I stumbled up and down the ballast and found five more, unbuttoning my shirt and nesting them against my chest, upright and capless. We had the sandpiper for if you should run, and the flycatcher for if you should hide. I can't remember why we had the loon. I crouched in the space between coal trains, cradling the bottles and feeling the weight of how little I had to spill. I rubbed coal on my face. I felt crazy. I thought about being found like this. I tried to imagine what my story would be, a version with my brother in it, a version with no brother. 
I swear I could smell rain a thousand miles away. I could smell rain in the soot. I folded my hands around my lips and made the gray ghost, which told him where I was and also meant stay alert and also meant some other things only owls understood. Um, so uh, this next poem uh, grows out of an experience of being lost in the woods. I don't know if any of you uh, watching have experienced getting turned around out in the bush and uh, losing track of where you are. Uh, this next one is kind of uh, about an experience like that, and it's called primer. And that word means, uh, a primer is a, a short collection, a uh, short booklet that introduces a child to a topic. Primer. And what if you have nothing? I pick up a stick. Yes, that's always first. And next, I see what I can see around me. Find the sun or moon, find high ground, find north by where the moss grows. Yes, now close your eyes, find them. The sun's behind, I can feel it on my neck. High ground's to my right, north's ahead. Yes, and the wind? The wind's west. It cools my left temple. Yes, and next. If I can bug out, I bug out. Otherwise, I go high and dig a foxhole and tie something bright above me. You're forgetting something. Right, first I cut my name in the dirt. Then I go high. Yes, and next. I walk a loop with my bright thing in sight. If I find a better stick, I switch for it. Yes, and if you need to cry, I crawl inside my foxhole and cry. And what do you tell yourself as you cry? Someone's coming. Yes. And what if no one comes? Each hour I call in all directions. I listen. Yes. And what do you listen for? Sounds that shouldn't be there. Yes. Sounds that should be there but aren't. Yes. And what have you heard since we started? A bird. Yes. Another bird far away. Yes. A gust in the trees. Yes. Your voice, if your voice counts. Yes. My voice counts. So a uh, big part of my life uh, that I write about a fair amount is uh, dumpster diving. Uh, I'm an avid uh, dumpster diver and have been uh, for uh, like 17 years now. Uh, and for a stint in my 20s, um, I, li I lived entirely off of, of food um, I found in dumpsters for about five years. I, I stopped buying groceries altogether. <clears throat> um, and this next poem uh, grows out of that era and, and out of my experiences with, with dumpster diving. And um, it's, it's sort of a, a, a hobby that's fascinating. I mean, you know, it's you, sort of like a treasure hunt. You... you um, by digging around in the trash, you find out a lot about the employees that work for different companies. Uh, you see a lot of how much waste there is in America um, from corporations. Um, you sort of go on these treasure hunts of, of noticing, you know, who's swapping shifts with who and who has a dentist appointment. And, you know, there's this in interesting bit of information. So that's a, that's a fun aspect of it. Uh, but it, for me personally, it also has a, a bit of a darker side. Uh, I, I have a, a kind of an issue with frugality. I'm sort of ex extremely frugal um, and I sort of can't, I, I struggle to snap out of it. Um, and dumpster diving in a way kind of feeds, feeds that uh, obsession of mine. So this poem grows out of that, uh, those, those sort of uh, conflicting issues. Uh, this one's called Pride. After pulling a score from the dumpster behind Kroger's, I stroll through the sliding doors with egg-caked hands. The greeter greets me as I pass. I scan the aisles like a surgeon, studying the mint versions of organs she cuts out of men. The dented cans of black beans, undented, would have cost me ten bucks. The unexpired cartons of cream, another twenty. I smile at the math. For the dark roast alone, I'd have forked over forty-seven. For eight uncracked eggs out of a dozen, about a buck eleven. Might as well be money I found. Might as well be money I made. By the time I get to the frozen foods, I'm up two hundred. Mark down meats and I'm up three. In the bathroom, I lock the door behind me and twist on the tap. As the yellow crust 
peels off my hands, the mirror clouds over with steam. I finger the total where my face used to be. So um, this collection uh, deals a lot with traveling around the country um, and staying with strangers. Um, uh, I, I've had um, some, some uh, very, very strange and interesting and, and lovely experiences uh, having pe uh, people taking me in as I've traveled uh, around the country, hitchhiking and, and bicycling and on freight trains. Uh, and this next poem is a dramatic monologue uh, from the perspective of one of these, these people who took me in uh, while I was traveling. And so he's speaking uh, sort of to me, to my character, uh, while he's also taking care of his aging mother. Uh, so uh, in this situation, this character's name is Lyle, and he's ha uh, having to uh, grapple with a couple things at the same time. Uh, this one's called Lyle Clears My Throat. Fair warning, I gotta roll my mother every half hour or so to curb her bed sores, but I want to hear this story. Just keep it down, because she's asleep and I need the door cracked so I can hear her heart. Well, not her heart. The monitor is what I listen to. It's been a year this June. I come upstairs and found her on the floor, drove her to local before they coptered us to the U. Let me roll her quick, and then you can start your travelogue, which I'm dying to hear. Where we're at now, she can't lift her own arm, but if you lift it to start with, she can ease it back down real slow, controlling the speed and choosing where it lands, you know? They got her on a food tube and all that, machines tracking her heart and lungs, the works. She's basically comatose, but she can shake her head for no, and you'd be surprised how much power that gives you. They had her hooked up to this thing, I don't know what you call it, a shock treatment kind of thing they hoped would give her back her speech. But when they explained all this, she shook her head. The doctor said, shake once for yes and four times for no. If the math wasn't happening, I could have called the shots. But you know damn well her head shook exactly four times. So they sent us home. Somehow she bosses me around with that head shake, gets across every little message. And it's weird, I used to be as quiet as a mule, but with her gone mute, I feel it's my duty to charm the air. But enough of me clearing your throat. I'll shut up so you can tell about your travels. Just let me roll her once more. Friends ask me how I'm holding up. That's what they say. How you holding up? But what they mean to say is this. How's tending a vegetable that don't grow? Well, if there's a God and he's listening right now, I'm nothing short of ashamed. This thing beat the Jesus right out of me. But when you live what I lived and see what I seen happen to who it happened to, there just ain't nothing in it. No order, no holiness. And don't sit there eyeballing me like maybe the Lord's breaking earth to sow seeds. Don't tell me there's a larger purpose. I won't hear it. I won't listen to another word. So that's Lyle. Um, this uh, next poem is another one that is uh, sort of uh, taking a look at uh, a homestay, a, a sort of uh, visit with a stranger while traveling. <laughs> Uh, but offers kind of a different perspective. And this one takes place in uh, Moorcroft, Wyoming, a very small town. This one's called Moorcroft. You gave me a ride when I was lost in Wyoming, took me to your home, showed me your gun collection. You had to go shoulder deep through the clothes in the closet to reach. They were old and unloaded, you told me, and you didn't shoot them anymore just oiled them and kept them perfectly clean. I was careful not to flinch as I watched the double barrel raise and train on my face. The tooth you flashed in the grin after, the spasm in your hands as you swung the gun and pointed it at yourself to show evenness. You told me about doing five years for murder, asked if I would have done anything different, finding a grown man raping my six-year-old niece. I wouldn't change it, you said. I wouldn't take it back. You patted your heart with your hand. Family is family, you whispered, as you brought me clean sheets for my bed. 
So this next one, um, hope y'all are doing okay. Holding out, there's a lot of a lot of poetry coming at you. Uh, this next one is, is sort of a, a bit of like a father son poem. But if uh, you're not a father or a son, I'm I'm sure there's a way for you to sort of wrangle it uh, into metaphor uh, for it to, to apply to one of your own relationships. Um, this one's called Northern Corn. Traveling alone through Minnesota as the corn comes in. Steel silos filling to the brim. Black trees leaning off the south sides of hills as cold light falls slantwise against the grist mills. You have allowed another year to pass. You have learned very little. But that little is what you're throwing in the furnace. That little is stoking the dust coals of last year and burning something burning blue. The 90-year-old father is bringing his crop in. He climbs off the combine, checks the engine, moves an oak branch. He pours rye whiskey from a thermos and sips the lidless excess of his private noon, the size of his hands, the size of one finger, the flathead prairie of his callous thumb pad. He lies awake in the middle of the night and whispers something, and suddenly loves his son again. The way excess falls out of him, the way oil runs down the Mississippi River and remains on the surface and burns. The father no longer breathing, the respirator breathing, the father lying in a hospital bed in a nightgown, the plastic tubes and machinery, the whole hospital breathing, the janitor waxing the vinyl floors at midnight while life is trying hard to leave. You must go to your father while he is still your father. You must hold him. You must kiss him. You must listen. You must see the son in the father and wonder. You must admit that you wonder. Stand above him and wonder. Drop his swelled up hand. Whisper something. Now unplug the machine. So I grew up, I grew up in northern Minnesota a town called Moorhead, uh, which is sort of a suburb of Fargo, North Dakota, right on the North Dakota-Minnesota border. So if you've seen the, sh the show Fargo or the, or the movie Fargo, that's where I'm from. Uh, and uh, my parents uh, are both Lutheran pastors, uh, I, and I grew up attending both of their congregations. Uh, my dad was a pastor in Moorhead, Minnesota, and my mom was a pastor across the river in Fargo. And uh, so a lot of, for my brothers and I, it was a lot of time at church uh, and we did our best to ignore uh, and avoid what my parents were doing and what they were saying. So uh, once we were old enough to leave the, the front pew, uh, we would sit in church uh, up in the balcony next to the organist, uh, trying to be as far from the pulpit as possible. Um, but for as much as I, I kind of attempted to plug my ears uh, as a kid, uh, the language of the church and my parents' sermons uh, have had a, a big effect on me, uh, sort of almost against my will. And this next poem uh, uses some language from the church and uh, grows out of um, that childhood uh, and the, the life that I've had. Uh, it's actually the title poem of, of the collection, The Low Passions. And The Low Passions is uh, sort of a, an obscure Christian term. Uh, that means um, the low passions means uh, the thing, uh, all things of the earth, all things physical. It's usually used in a negative context, sort of to mean um, the things that seduce us, the things of this world that seduce us, uh, as opposed to the high passions, uh, which are God and heaven and things of the spirit. Uh, and so uh, in the context of my collection, uh, I'm sort of, uh, in a sense, reclaiming it a bit as a term. Uh, and uh, in, in, in my mind, giving it a more positive connotation, um, uh, the, the physicality of this world being, being something very special. Um, and uh, I hope that comes across in these poems. Um, but yeah, this next one uh, is called The Low Passions. The Lord came down because God wasn't enough. He lies on sodden cardboard behind bushes in the churchyard, wrapped in faded red, a sleeping bag he found or traded for, dark stains like clouds before a downpour, the stone wall beside him rising, always rising, 
the edges of stone going blunt where the choir boy climbs. He opens his mouth, but nothing goes in and nothing comes out. Like the sideshow man who long ago lost his right testicle to the crossbar of a huffy, he pedals the leftover pain, the stitches clipped a week later by his father, the fiberglass bathtub running with color, the puffy new scar, the crooked look of the pitted half sack. He tells me, you only need one nut. And I want to believe him. I want to believe he can still get it up. I want to believe he has daughters, sons, a grandchild on the way, a wife at home in a blue apron baking. But why this day-old bread from the dumpster? This stash of hollow bottles in the buckthorn, this wrinkled can of Pabst. The Lord came down because God wasn't enough. Because the childless man draws the bath water and cries. Because the choir boy never sings as he climbs. Because the bread has all molded and the mouths are all open. Open to the clotting air. Homeless, anything helps. Anything, anything you can spare. God bless you. God bless you. God bless. God. Lord God. God God. Good God. Good Lord. Very good God. So just, uh, I just have two, uh, two more poems for you. So we're, we're angling, uh, toward the finishing line here. Uh, I hope you all are enjoying it. Um, this next one is, sort of returns to, um, childhood and is sort of a partner poem to Dynamite, the first one I read, uh, if you'll remember the, the fight scene from earlier. This one is sort of, um, an attempt to have a, a bit of a, a, a afterthought on that and some, some resolution. Uh, this one is called After Fighting. Sometimes my brother and I let go of rage and snuck in the garage to cut fistfuls of beef from the chest freezer, then lay side by side in the pines waiting for animals to come. We didn't speak hardly even breathed as we played dead on the rust-colored needles, the clods of meat cupped loosely in our upturned palms. And if we waited long enough, if we let the clods thaw and seep their blood-deep sweetness, sometimes a chipmunk slunk up and nuzzled into our isthmus, crossing timidly from his hand to mine, mine to his, chewing. Its hunger like an invisible line strung between us. The, uh, the last poem I'm going to read for you all sort of returns to um, the, the, the freight hopping uh, elements of the, of the collection, uh, which there are many of. Uh, if you decide to, to sort of check out the whole book, there's uh, many adventure stories to, to dive into that I'm not reading for you tonight. Um, and I, I hope you do. Uh, but this next one grows out of a train hopping trip that I took in uh, Canada. Um, and in Canada, there's a special type of uh, freight car called a Canadian grainer. And uh, they're, they're special um, because on the back end of them, they have this huge metal shape of uh, a, v, a V of metal on the back end. And inside that V of metal, there's a, a big round large hole that you can climb inside. And it's like the perfect hiding spot um, uh, for a train hopper. Uh, it's sort of the luxury ride of train hopping. It keeps you out of the rain, keeps you out of sight of the bulls who might be looking for you. Uh, it actually has a, a like a sloped wall inside it, so you can like kind of lean back like you're sitting in a lazy boy. Uh, and it's sort of just like the ideal ride. Um, and uh, this this big round hole that you climb inside is nicknamed the owl's eye because it looks like this big round owl's eye. Um, and so for this poem, if you can imagine uh, being inside this, this big round hole on the back of a freight train and looking out backwards at the landscape that you've been coming through, uh, that's sort of, it's sort of a meditative poem and that's sort of the, the space that you're, that you're inhabiting. Um, this one's called Riding the Owl's Eye. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for listening. Uh, I hope you're, you're enjoying the poems. Uh, I hope you go on to check out more. And, and of course, I hope you tune in, tune in for uh, all the next rounds of Poets Corner. It's just a wonderful series, and I'm very honored to be part of it. Um, uh, but here we go for the last poem. Riding the Owl's Eye. Out of all the dumpsters that could have been empty, all the weather that could have bloomed over the prairie and ruined me, 
All the cars that could have sped by without hesitating and left me on the fog line, nameless forever. The trains that could have taken my legs. The men who could have pulled a switchblade and opened me like a flood enfolding the red North Dakota clay. Out of all the hazards we pass through in amazement, all the stories we tell of luck and good fortune and prayer and survival, it is always our own lungs that dry up and darken, our own miles that straighten, our own hunger that wanes. The Lord gives us mountains and we fail to mine out that grandness. The Lord gives us trains and we waste those distances transporting coal. Some say the world is broken. Some say the good Lord has forsaken our dreams. But I say it is our own throat that grows the cancer, our own asthma that blackens our breath to a wheeze. And the truth is the mile long train will always crawl past. The socket fixed gaze of the owl's skull will always turn perfectly backwards. We will always be bodies among ghosts. And what is important to them is not how we ride on the westbound freighter, not how we shiver, not how we crawl crooked and thin and climb yet again into the trembling eye hole. It is not about suffering. It is not about fear. We must peer out from inside the owl's eye. Watch the coal dust cook in the wind eddies. Watch it linger, watch it spiral thinly as it bruises the blue faded mind of the buffalo sky. We must be the pupil that swells in the coming darkness, the cargo worth carrying across the distances. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed the whole reading um, and I hope you tune in next time. Have a good night, everybody.